Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Well, James Bragg is here. If you read our flyer, you may know his name. He was the editor of the Evangelist for 30, 35 years, was it? I was there, 37, 37 editor, years. And I think we're going to hear, actually, there's one book, but two very interesting stories. Cause I've just been talking to him about this V-mail stuff from World War II. So th we're going to hear about the, the, sergeant, the story of Sergeant Bailey is very fascinating and interesting, but the story of how Jim came about it is just as interesting. So here's Jim Bragg. The book is Searching for Sergeant Bailey saluting an ordinary soldier in World War II. Thank you very much for coming out <clears throat> on your lunch hour. I appreciate it, and I'm getting hungry watching you. Um, I will leave time at the end for questions, but if during my talk there is a question, don't be afraid to raise your hand Can you for a clarification or, or comments. People, after my talks, I've been speaking at libraries and fraternal okay. organizations and senior centers. And during my talks or afterwards, they often don't ask a question. They want to share their own experience or tell me something they know or add to my information. I've had several veterans come up to me, pull me aside, and say, I want to tell you the story of my experience in World War II. And I feel very honored when they do that uh, because so many kept silent. A little over three years ago, I walked into an antique store and walked out with this. Well, there was three years in between. I retired in the spring of 2008 from being the editor of the Evangelist newspaper and wanted to continue writing, that's what I know how to do. There's a handyman who comes to our house and he says to me all the time, I don't write, you don't tinker. <laughs> because he's mainly there to fix what I have messed up. So I know how to write, so that's what I wanted to continue to do. But instead of continuing to write about religion, which I had done for almost 40 years, I wanted to write about another love of mine, which was history. Even while I worked at The Evangelist, I wrote about history for Colonial Williamsburg's history magazine. And after I retired, I sent, to see if I still had it, I sent seven ideas to a magazine called History, and they accepted five of them. So very encouraging to a, a young man like myself. That was in the spring of 08. In December of 08, my wife and I made what is a regular and almost annual journey to go to Williamsburg. It's where we honeymooned in, 19, in 1968. So in 2008, it was our 40th wedding anniversary. We stopped on the way down, uh, it's a long journey, which we get off of 95 just after uh, Fredericksburg because 95 being 95, you don't want to be on it. And we take a back road. But we stopped short of Williamsburg to stretch our legs and went into an antique store, antique mall. And she went down one aisle and I went down another, neither of us anticipating that we were going to buy anything. But I saw in a bowl, a china bowl, the sort you would put salad in, 39 letters from Sergeant Bailey, home to his mother. And I thought this might make an interesting article for a magazine. Three years later, I think it's made an interesting book. Because I became fascinated with his story, and my wife will tell you I became obsessed with his story. Um, they were, most of them, all but one, were V-mails. And I'm wondering, some of you older people here, do you remember V-mails? No. One does, one doesn't. I'll pass this around, and if you'll be careful with it, that V-mail is not one of Sergeant Bailey's. I don't bring those out because they are so precious to me. Uh, but I do want people to see what a V-mail looks like. V-mails were a method of communicating during World War II from here overseas and vice versa. And you went into a stationary store, and there you could buy, or the soldiers were provided with them, you could buy a V-mail form. And you can find your writing within the red 
lines, it then folded itself into an envelope and you sent it off. But it did not go to the person you were writing to. It went to a processing center. And there it was microfilmed, reduced to the size of your thumbnail. 18,000 V-mails could be fit on one reel of film, microfilm. And the reason this was done was to save weight and space to transport these letters overseas. And they saved a lot of weight and space on ships and planes. Not everybody used V-mails. There were just as many and maybe more regular air mail sent during the war. But it did save a lot of tonnage. When it got to the near the point where it was going to be delivered, it was sent to a processing center again and blown back up. But as you can see from the one that I held up and that's going around the room, they were blown back up to only half their original size. So what had begun with what I showed you was almost eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper became the size of a man's palm. This caused a problem, as you can, people taking off their glasses and holding it like this. In the one that's going around, a woman writes to her husband, I know you have trouble reading these, so I'm going to write really large. Well, when you see what her really large was reduced to, you'll understand the difficulty. There's, I've read now hundreds and hundreds of V-mails, uh, not just Sergeant Bailey's, but V-mails from 50 other soldiers, and they're quoted in the book as well. And frequently, they will say, going overseas in either direction, someone will say, I don't know how you read them. They did sell special magnifying glasses for people if they wanted to buy it so that they could be Sherlock Holmes and, and read the letters. That's what I found in the antique store. When I got home, I had forgotten that I bought them. They sat in my glove compartment, and then finally one day I said, oh, those letters. So I got them out and began reading them. And this is an example of one of his. And what interested me from the beginning is right up here. Because on the V-mail, it said who it came from. And then I was interested in over here, where the V-mail goes to. And there's a lot of information there. If you have these in your attic or basement or somewhere, or you can go on eBay, where they are for sale. Remind me to talk about that later. Uh, I knew instantly Sergeant Bailey's Army Service number. He's written it above his name. I knew his almost full name, James B. Bailey. I knew his unit, the 343rd Quartermaster Depot Company Supply. I knew that he was at the APO, Army Post Office 503, but I didn't know where that was. I knew the date he wrote, because he says so. I knew his, obviously, rank sergeant, and that this went to San Francisco. That it went to the San Francisco Processing Center indicated that he was in the Pacific. I knew that he was writing to his mother, because he begins, dearest mother, and that her name was Mrs. R.B. Bailey, and that she lived in Prince George, Virginia. So even before I got to the text of the letter, I knew a lot. But what interested me when I got to the end is that he did not sign his letter James, or Jim, or Jimmy. He signed it Boysaw, B-O-I-S-S-E-A-U. And his mother's name was R.B., and in other letters, he spelled out her first name, Rella, R-E-L-L-A, which itself was short for Irella, I-R-E-L-L-A. These were interesting names to me. But I took a guess and said he signed it, Boysaw, his middle initial is B, her middle initial is B, I'll bet her maiden name is Boysaw. It was a bet I won. Uh, she was from the Boysaw family, which you can find all over Virginia and North Carolina especially. Uh, descendants of a uh, dissident minister who came over from France in, I think, the 17th century. Why was he known as Boysaw? That was a question I had. Why wasn't he Jim? How would you pronounce Boysaw? When I saw that he was from Prince George, I went to the computer and typed in Prince George, Virginia, and I found that it was a very tiny town south of Richmond in Prince George County. And the town, I shouldn't call it a town because the people there that I talked to said, do not call us a town, we are a neighborhood. And I've been there twice and it is 
a few houses, a gas station, and the courthouse, which is what gives the town some prominence. It's the county courthouse. Well, the fact that the courthouse is there meant the historical society was there. So I called and I said, would you know this Sergeant James B. called Boisaw Bailey, or as I pronounced it, being from the north and very fancy, Boisseau Bailey. And she said, I've never heard of him. And for all I knew, he was still alive. She said, but I'll check. A couple of days later, she called me and she said, I spoke to my volunteers who are mostly older women, and they went crazy. I said, what do you mean? She said, smiles, laughter, bright faces, started telling stories about him. Some of them went to high school with him. Some of them dated him. And I said, oh my goodness, <laughs> someone with that long a, an impression, there's something more than an article. And then I found out that he was no longer alive. And I said, well, I want to talk to some of these people. And she said, I'll give you one of the volunteers who be sort of your go-between. So that was a woman named Nancy Kroll. And I called her and spoke to her a little bit. And she got some initial basic information, such as his mother and father's names and their death dates. And I said, now about this Boisseau. And she said, all right, we're stopping the conversation at Boisseau. I said, what's wrong? It's Boisseau, she says. I said, really, Boisseau? She goes, that's how it's pronounced. I said, all right, Boisseau Bailey. And she began telling me a little bit about the town. And I, about halfway through our, our talk, I said, I'm coming. I'm coming down. And she said, you're coming down where? And I said, I'm coming down to Prince George. And she, well, I know she thought I was insane, because later on she told me that she thought I was insane. I said, I want to see the house he grew up in. I want to see the town or the neighborhood, as you call it. I want to see the courthouse. I want to get a sense of the place he lived in. And six weeks after I bought the letters, I was standing in front of the house he grew up in that his parents owned, which was literally a stone's throw from the courthouse. His father worked for the county. His mother was postmistress. So all the letters came into her little shed, really. It was the size of the post office. It was beside her house. And I got to meet people who knew him, some relatives, some girls who dated him, uh, some men who knew him both before and after the war, and began to get an idea of who he was. As I began putting things together, I thought, what am I writing about here? He was, he's not a hero in the traditional sense. He didn't put the flag up on Iwo Jima. He didn't invade Normandy. He didn't fly bombers over Berlin. He was a quartermaster. That meant he was a supply officer, supply sergeant, who ran a warehouse in New Guinea on Oro Bay, O-R-O-B-A-Y. Now, how do I know that's where he was? Because now you can look up the Army post offices on the internet, and 503 is Oro Bay, New Guinea. There's a list on the internet that tells you each place and the dates when it was that. 503 was later Tokyo, uh, but when he was there, it was in New Guinea. So I began to dig. What could I learn? I talked to the people who knew him. Google, the internet. I mean, I was speaking before my talk to one of the librarians who said, how did we do research before there was the internet? And I said, it was difficult back when I was writing articles for the evangelist. When you wanted to know something, you had to go to a library. You had to research it. You had to find an expert. You had to, I used to go, I used to read books, then look at the bibliography and acknowledgments and find other books and other people that I might be able to interview. Uh, eBay. I mentioned eBay. Uh, I do want to pause here and talk about eBay. It was very, 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 very helpful in writing this book because I could find pictures of New Guinea. I could find all sorts of information about the quartermasters. I could find articles and books. I'm happy and sad that I found letters. If you go to eBay and type in V-mail or World War II letters, letters, you will find hundreds for sale. I'm happy because I bought them and they helped fill out my book. I used them in the book to support what Sergeant Bailey says, to contradict what he says or feels, uh, to fill in blanks when he doesn't talk. He, d he didn't talk about how he got from America to New Guinea, but other people did. And there were 
as I understand it, basically three routes. You went to San Francisco and west. Uh, you went down to, through the Panama Canal and across. Or what seems to me the oddest, but I don't know. I, someone who does shipping can tell me. You would go down the east coast of America to the islands, the Bahamas, cut across to South Africa, go around it, go through the Indian Ocean, and come in what to me is the back door. And they all went to Australia first to be processed before they were sent to New Guinea. Uh, so that was the good news of eBay selling the letters. I, however, am very sad that families are selling letters on eBay. I read letters from husbands to wives, boyfriends to girlfriends, sons to fathers, sons to mothers, siblings to one another. Why do families want to get rid of them? I do not know. If they don't want them, which I don't understand, I would hope they would donate them to a library, to an historical society, to a museum, and not cast them into the wind. Uh, and you, you can ask, what do you plan to do with the ones you got? I will arrange for the ones I've used in researching my book to be given. His will go to the Historical Society in Prince George. And the other ones, I still have to figure out, they've got to go somewhere to be preserved. But uh, grandchildren don't want to read the letters from their grandfather to their grandmother? Uh, it, it just astonishes. And worse than that, they will take 200 letters and break them into lots and sell them 20 at a time. Those will be scattered over the U.S. and maybe the world and will never be reunited. And it's just astonishing. Uh, I have, the letters can be so touching and um, there's, I, there's one part of the book where I have a, an exchange between a husband and a wife and the husband does not make it out of World War II. And when that tinge is over the letters, and he keeps promising her, don't worry about me, I take care of myself, nothing's going to happen to me. And her final letter to him comes back, marked killed in action. Somebody sold that. I don't get it. End of sermon. <laughs> back to research. Uh, daydreaming. I'm speaking here to people who might be doing research about their own families, genealogy. Daydreaming. I walk every day for three miles and it was a great time or mowing the lawn or shoveling snow to let your mind go, what don't I know? How would I find it out? What else do I need? Who could help me? Where might I find this information? And don't be afraid to explore, to go looking for something because you might find something else. You know, why would I want to look there? But it turns out you did. <laughs> and when you sit at the internet, it's easy to noodle around. Uh, and you'd be surprised if people want to help you and you can get to secrets and one road leads to another. For 40 years almost I interviewed people for the evangelist and they want to help you. And there's ways when you interview people and you don't have to, I'm not talking only about formal interviews, when you sit and chat with someone about who knew your grandfather. And two big secrets, one is to nod. When people are talking to you, go like that. It encourages them to keep talking. And the other is shut up because people fill silences. And if they finish what they're saying and you just sit there, they say, oh, and did I tell you about the time? And, that's, and then you get the real good stuff. Um, so that's the process I followed. And um, tried to get at who he was. And I mentioned he wasn't a hero in the ordinary sense. The subtitle of my book is Saluting an Ordinary Soldier of World War II. And a number of people now who've read the book come to me and they say, he wasn't ordinary. And I say, well, what do you mean? He, he filled ships and planes with supplies so MacArthur could go across New Guinea. And they said, that was important. What he did was extraordinary. And I said, but he was a very ordinary guy. If you read the book, there's no surprise ending where he invents a cure for some disease or saves a schoolroom of children from a fire. He was an ordinary guy. And they say, that, that's the point. He was an ordinary guy who went and did what needed to be done of uh, the greatest generation. And I'm glad people are getting that. Um, as I was writing it, I thought, I don't know what I'm doing here. And you know, who else has done this? And then it occurred to me, the death of a salesman. 
Arthur Miller's play, now, what, 60 years old or so, older than that, um, it's death of a salesman, not death of a king, not death of a saint, not death of the wealthy man in town. It's death of a nobody. And toward the end, and I quote this in the front of the book, toward the end his wife says, attention has to be paid. This is a human being. It doesn't matter whether he was a nobody. It matters that he existed and attention, the famous phrase from the play, attention, attention must be paid. And so that's what I try to do with Sergeant Bailey is pay attention to him. And I think that in telling his story, I'm telling millions of stories about your relatives, uh, spouses maybe, uh, fathers, grandfathers, and women too. I interviewed uh, a whack for the book and read letters written by women. Getting the letters from home over there is difficult. I, d I did find some, but soldiers were told not to keep the letters. Um, they didn't for one reason was they got to be so big a pile that it was a nuisance to, to, to uh, cart around. But they were also told, don't have them with you because if you are killed or captured, they might be helpful to the enemy to be able to go through your mail. So it was rare uh, to have the letters from here over there uh, for research. But I did find some, again, on eBay. Um, but from there over here, a lot of families saved them. I think a lot of men said to their wives or mothers, save these for, for me for when I get back. I want to see what I did. And what he did was help MacArthur. And here's my quiz for today. New Guinea, which sits on top of Australia like a, a hat or an umbrella, is the second largest island in the world. What's the first? I hear two Greenlands and Australia. People usually guess Australia first. Um, but it's not classified as an island, so it is Greenland. New Guinea sits about the distance from New York to Albany is the distance from the top of Australia to the bottom of New Guinea. And if you laid the eastern edge of New Guinea on the eastern edge of the United States, I think it, I, you'll get it more specifically in the book, I think it sprawls to Chicago, if not beyond. That's how big it is. And where he, Sergeant Bailey, was is Oro Bay, which is right there on the upper eastern extended but upper coast. And MacArthur, when he left the Philippines, came to New Guinea. And uh, his first actions were to get the Japanese out of New Guinea. Shortly <coughs> after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese set their sights on New Guinea, their theory being by getting New Guinea, we neutralize, at least neutralize Australia. And we may invade Australia and use their resources, but we will keep them out of the war. So they began, I think, January 1942 to start heading toward New Guinea. And two major sea battles thwarted their plans, and that was Coral Sea and Midway, which so decimated the Japanese Navy that they couldn't deliver as much men and materials as they wanted to. They landed, generally speaking, on the western coast of Australia, of New Guinea. The Australians and later the Americans were on the east. And so it became a push back as the Japanese tried to come this way, the Allies were pushing this way. And as you can see in this illustration, with these jumps, MacArthur's strategy is very famous about being checkerboard or hopscotch that he would attack position A, a conquer it, and then instead of going to B, he would jump to C, thereby cutting off B from all supplies and assistance, and they would just wither. Then go on to E, D would wither, and that he would continue westward across the top of New Guinea. And it took, I think, almost a year to complete that process and get across so that from the western edge, he could then move up back to the Philippines and for his famous, uh, I have returned, walking through the surf and I have returned speech, or speech phrase. Um, Sergeant Bailey, to some extent, participated in that. Here's where I got blocked by not finding military records. I know he was in the Philippines. 
to what extent, I don't know. In a letter to his mother in the summer of 1944, he writes that he has begun cleaning his rifle. I suspect this must have worried her because why were you cleaning your rifle? And he says, it's been so long, it took me hours to clean. And then he says, I'm back on the rifle range. Well, these are signs that he is going to participate in the invasion. And I've talked to uh, veterans and I've described this to them and they say in uh, an invasion, cooks and quartermasters are infantry troops. They go in with the uh, invasion itself and they participate in that and then they resume their, their duties as cooks and quartermasters uh, when they have taken care of what the, the invasion and secured a beachhead. So I know that Sergeant Bailey was there because it's in his military records, but where, I don't know. To what length of time, I don't know. And what he did, I don't know. Now in research, I said you can find things you didn't know you could find. I found the commanding officer of the 343rd Quartermaster Depot Company Supply, Sergeant Bailey's unit, when it was in Manila. He is alive, he lives in New Orleans, I interviewed him. We've exchanged letters, he's told me all kinds of stories, he's mentioned in the book. And I said, was Sergeant Bailey there? And he says, you know, it's been <laughs> a long time. And he says, I remember a few names, I don't remember his name, but he said he could have been there. And after he read the book, he wrote me and he said, you know, he sounds like the kind of guy that would have been there, that his trustworthiness, his ability to do the job seems like someone that might have been there, but he says, I can't swear to it. And what they did, the quartermaster group, when it got to the Philippines, he said we became the biggest coffee roasters in the Pacific. And they supplied coffee throughout the Pacific and repaired typewriters. So I don't know if Sergeant Bailey did either one of those. I do know that the last letter I have from him is written to his mother in the uh, spring of 45. And he writes very boldly across the top of his letter, and this is not a V-mail, but an actual letter, New Guinea almost like I'm safe, you know, I'm back here. Um, but I don't, there's a gap in his letters, so I don't know when, how long he was in the Philippines and when he got back to New Guinea. So stitching all of this information together, I have told in the book his life story from his birth to his death, but concentrating on World War II because that's what it's about, saluting a soldier of World War II. And as I mentioned before, saluting, I think, all of the quartermasters and the signal corps and, and the engineers and the Seabees. For every infantryman that moved forward, there were 10 to 15 support troops. And he didn't budge because he needed the weapon, the ammunition, the uniform, the tent, the food, the transportation, and he had no way of getting that unless it came to him. So if the people behind there working in anonymity didn't do what they had to do, he didn't do what he had to do. Not taking away from him, not taking away from the guy who got shot at, obviously that's, that's uh, the spear point. But the spear has a shaft and it's all these men and women like Sergeant Bailey and the whack I interviewed who lives in Vermont. She was in New Guinea and New Guinea read about it in the book, it's got to be the worst place in the world. I don't know how people put up with it. Um, I've talked to veterans and after my talks who were there and they said it was just god awful. The heat, the rain, the mosquitoes, the malaria, Sergeant Bailey had malaria which is the gift that keeps on giving and uh, people who knew him after the war said he would, he would get recurrences of it. He also had what was called jungle rot uh, or sometimes creeping crud and that was it was so moist that if you got the slightest cut your skin would just bust open and unless you treated it immediately he said he described it as my skin would fall off and he's one letter to his mother he says I'm wearing gloves from now on to eat I'm wearing them he says I don't care if it helps I'm wearing them and uh, uh, scabies and uh, I mean scrub typhus it was just awful and any letter that I've read by a soldier in New Guinea says that it was awful. There's an aphorism I quote in the book in a war there are no unwounded soldiers. 
Sergeant Bailey was not wounded in the traditional sense. He did not sustain any injuries other than a broken thumb, which didn't get you a Purple Heart. Um, but he was wounded, and, and I think all these men and women were. He was a young man in a small town, going about his life, had a girlfriend, had his family there, his mother, you know, his, his family of origin there, had a job, and the Army came and said, thank you very much for taking you away from all of that. And he was drafted before Pearl Harbor. A lot of people don't know there was a draft before Pearl Harbor. And he served until after Hiroshima. So for the entirety of World War II, he was in the service, two years in, in stateside and two years in New Guinea. So he was taken, and the Army said, we'll now take you, and guess where we're going to put you? As far away as we can, and for as long as we want. The duration plus six months, as your draft notice said. So he was really a stranger in a strange land and torn away from everything he knew and loved. And those V-mails were the connecting strings. And we got to remember that today you hear about soldiers in, in the Iraq and Afghanistan who tweet and make phone calls and send emails and are instantly in contact. And if a baby's born, you, you know it the minute it happens. A letter from New Guinea to Virginia took three to four weeks. So if he said to his mother, he was concerned about his car, which had to be repaired. Has my car been report, repaired, he asks. It would take three to four weeks to get to her. And then you cross your fingers that she's going to answer the question. And three to four weeks back. So that's the length of time, six weeks to two months, before you got a response to what you wanted to know. And he did want to know about his hometown. You know, he wanted to know about, he called them the scoundrels in town what was going on, who was marrying who, who had died, what babies were born, just to, to keep that connection to where he was from. And that, that gap in time had to have been awful. And that, that separation, that being lost, and, and where am I, and what is expected of me, and what will happen to me, had to eat at him. I will finish with one final story. And for my book, I not only read letters and books and so forth, I talked to veterans and met with them. And at one point, I got three of them together, two uh, who were in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, one who was wounded three times. When I interviewed him separately, by the way, on his wall, he had a framed uh, a picture, assembly of you know, his medals and his discharge papers and his draft notice and so forth. And I looked at it and I said, there's only two Purple Hearts. You said you were wounded three times. And he said, I couldn't be bothered the third time. He said, you had to walk back to an aid station to get proof that you were wounded. And he said, you would go back, you'd get fixed up. Then you had to go back and find your unit, which had moved on. And he said, ah. He says, I regret it now, because it would be nice to have three. But he said, oh, it was just too much trouble. So I got these two Battle of the Bulge veterans and a man who was in New Guinea, but he was an airplane mechanic, never in any immediate danger, although you never knew. And had them, I said, talk. Just swap your stories, and I'll listen. I'm going to use them in the book. This wasn't a surprise to them. Uh, but I'll sit in the corner and listen. So they did. They told about how they were drafted and where they went and what they experienced. And at the end, one of the Battle of the Bulge veterans said to the others, how long did it take you before you spoke about this? And he said, I'll tell you, it took me about 50 years. And the second Battle of the Bulge veteran said, that's about right, half a century. And the New Guinea serviceman, never in any real danger, said, I've never spoken about it before. I will never speak about it again. This is how deeply wounded these men and women could be. And I think I would say all of them were to some extent. I think Lot came back with bravado and said, ah, it didn't bother me. I think it bothered them. I think it could be seen in behavior and uh, in the smothering of emotions that men were taught. You don't cry. You don't complain. You go about your business. You're John Wayne. You're strong and silent. Get on with it. And I think that eats away at you. Um, I'm going into a psychology lecture, which I'm not qualified for. But I think that that can happen to so many people. And I shouldn't say it happens to everyone. It happens to many people. And uh, that's the, uh, the wounds that were experienced by Sergeant Bailey and people like him. I hope you will read my book. Uh, it can be found in local bookstores or on Amazon.com or in libraries. And I appreciate your listening attentively. And if you have some questions or comments, I'll be happy to listen to them.
Yes. Get back to the B mail. Were the uh, microfilms uh, <coughs> saved and stored? No, as far as I know, they're gone. They're Unless the family saved them. The, micro, the original letters were destroyed yeah. once they were microfilmed, and I think the microfilm was destroyed as well. I, or at least I've never read anything that said they're in the National Archives or something like that, not as far as I know. Online, in addition to eBay, if you want to read V-mails, there's lots of collections posted. Uh, universities have posted them, or individual families have posted them, and you can find them easily by searching for V-mail on Google or whatever your search engine is, and uh, you can read thousands of them online. Well, I was just going to comment. Um, my parents sent a lot of emails. My, my mother had a brother-in-law that uh, was serving, and uh, dozens of, uh, of uh, first cousins that uh, they sent emails. So, and I remember the email as being uh, a light blue um, kind of tissue paper yeah. that had some uh, reinforcement threads in it. I think those are air mails. Yeah, I think those were air mails. They They're like very thin. One page with the, the envelope and, and uh, the text and one sheet of paper. I think those. Are, I'm pretty sure those are air mails rather than V mails. So I'm sorry. Let me stop you. Yep. You started to ask. How long did he live after the war? I've been asked this question. How long did he live after the war? And sometimes I'll answer the question, and sometimes I say, doesn't she want to read the book? <laughs> um, which one do you want me to do? Do you want me to tell you? Oh, he says, don't tell you. I'll tell you afterwards if you want to come up to me. Yes. So these V-mails went back and forth, Yeah. trust. And did you find any where uh, you could tell it had been censored or redacted in any way? Yeah, the mail from here was not censored, but all soldiers' mail was at least supposed to be censored. I read in the book by one uh, unit guy in Europe who said, he said, I have people in my unit who write every day. I have people who write multiple letters every day. He says, I, I don't have time for it. And so he says, eventually, I just rubber stamp them, literally. But yes, there are examples of crossed out, blacked out sections. My favorite is a letter written by a soldier to his wife saying, there's lots I can't tell you about, but I'm sure that I can tell you that I'm in and that was actually clipped out. There's a space in the letter. So he may have been sure, but the censor said, you're not telling where you are. Uh, that's often the, the thing that will be, will be clipped out is where they were. And then if, I think they knew enough not to mention the size of the unit they were in or what specific unit. Actually, V-mail was pretty well hated, too. Why is that? Because, well, first of all, people sending overseas didn't want to hear it. was exposed. If you sent a letter, it wasn't open. And then the mail that came back was, was of course, small and hard to read. Yes. But that you learned to live with. But they didn't like the idea that other people were going were to see what they wrote. I think the processing was so voluminous. Nobody had any time to read your, your letters, well, but I can understand the worry. Yeah, because they didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it's, you sent it, and that was, that was it. And you knew that it was your letter was taken out this time. Yes. And uh, if you were writing something that you didn't want to, anyone to see, you were very, very reluctant to use the mail. They also censored pictures. I have a letter from a soldier in England writing home, and he had been born in England. And he wrote home and said, "I met with, I met with Aunt Kathy and so forth, and they took me to the place where I was born and so forth." And he said, "I would include pictures I took." But the censor says, I can't, because they identify where I am. That someone, if they got the letter, could say, oh, that church is in that location. That's where they are. There was some pretty clever ways that they had of explaining where they, they were, too. In the book, I mentioned a couple. Uh, a man, before he came over, developed a code with his wife. And he said, if I write sincere, he must have known he was going to the Pacific. He said, if I say sincerely yours with a capital Y, I'm in Australia. <laughs> if I say lowercase y, I'm near Australia. <laughs> and then another guy said, there was a columnist at the time, a commentator, Arthur Brisbane. And in a letter he said, boy, I'm really enjoying Arthur Brisbane's words. And the censor said, ah, 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 ah. It was a, I, I can tell you one case, though, a, a CB 
I was stationed on Green Island, which is a small island in, uh, in the Pacific. And he wrote his wife referring to friends that they had in Green Island. So she figured out where we were. Ah. Yeah, somebody, I read one, he had set up a grid, I guess, on a world map. And he wrote back and said, I'm at 14 M Street, or he would say, remember Ann Jane who lived at 14 M Street? And so they could <laughs> get the coordinates and see generally where he was. Any other questions? Yep. I just have to mention the interest I had when I saw the flyer here at the library, I had my, well, my favorite uncle, I have to say, he served in New Guinea. He was uh, in the Fifth Air Force. And he had kind of a, a backwater job. Uh, he may have been an armorer, you know, yeah. loaded the bombs and the ammunition and things like that. He used to tell me stories that they would fly B-17s to Australia for supplies, usually beer. They'd, they'd fly, load the bomb bay up with beer and come back to, you know, to. Port Moresby, uh, New Guinea is where, where he was. But uh, the letter, the letters remind me, when he passed away, he left me everything, his house, the contents and whatnot. Now, my dad was his executor. However, being that the contents of the house were left to me, what, what I got were letters from a girlfriend of his in Australia. He, he, well, he married a local girl, the girl from Cohoes, after the war. Uh, to this day, I haven't read all the letters. There's probably 10 or 12. I've read two or three of them. I never showed them to my, my dad. Uh, I felt they were none of his business. Uh, as I say, I, I only read two or three, and, and I stopped because I thought I might be prying. Mm -hmm. But after you talking about this book, I will, I may even share them with you. Yeah. I, I will finish reading them all. I mean, there was nothing risque. I mean, he, they, he didn't talk about any dalliances had with this woman in Australia. The one, the one thing that comes to mind, though, he kind of left her behind, because I think he might have said to her, after the war, I'll bring you back to the States, because she seemed to have hope that he would, and uh, he never did. And that was typical of my Uncle Jim. <laughs> <laughs> You're mentioning of the flyer in New Guinea, one of the talks I gave was at a senior center, and they invited me to lunch. And I sat beside several veterans, but the one guy said, I was in New Guinea and I was a pilot. I said, what did you do? And he said, well, my job was just to fly between New Guinea and Australia getting supplies. Yeah. And I said, now I've been told that if you wanted a drink, the pilots were the people to see. And he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> he said, we could hide stuff all over that plane. And he said, we got a good thing going. I said, what was that? He said, we would get cigarettes in Australia, bring them up and sell them at an inflated price. Take that money, go back when we went back to Australia, get liquor, bring it back up, sell it at an inflated price. He said, we were making all kinds of money. I, I remember my uncle saying, if he was in uh, Australia on leave, he, he, he and his buddies, would, they would want scotch. And they'd say, we don't want any local scotch. We want scotch from Scotland, <laughs> you know? The other thing, too, by the way, he, he left me, and it's a, it's a treasure, a yearbook from uh, the 5th Air Force, his squadron, and the pictures. The only thing I regret, he didn't name any, there's no captions under the, it's just the, pictures of the men, the, the crew, the bomber crews and whatnot, and, and then the, the maintenance crews and things like that. So, I mean, naturally, on page 103 or whatever it is, I can pick him out, uh, but uh, any of his buddies that he used to mention over the years, I, I don't know who these men were. Well, if you begin looking online, 
you may find people have started to post that information. There's a lot of units okay. that have developed their own websites yeah, yeah. and uh, or put out books afterwards mm -hmm. that or put it, have said there are no captions. We're going to put the captions out. There's stuff might be out there. And read between the lines of those letters. That's, when yeah. you start to do that, then you get a deeper sense of it. I like the whole idea of what you're doing, uh, uh, capturing and, and uh, promoting the history of those who, who uh, work behind the scenes. Uh, our, whole, our whole lives, too many times, we're, we're, we seem to be uh, looking for heroes, and sometimes the heroes are behind the scenes. Uh, the other thing I would like to, to ask, and I hope this isn't a question that uh, puts you aback, but I would like to know, New Guinea has a population. What happened to the people who were natives? <clears throat> in one of his letters, Sergeant Bailey, could you hear her question? She wanted no. to know about the native population of New Guinea. Yeah. In one of his letters, Sergeant Bailey them. says to his mother, here's a typical army event, he says. I've been put in charge of handing out passes. And he said, passes to go where? The troops were on the shores. If you went inland, you were literally going to be eaten. There were headhunters and cannibals on the interior. And so he said, I'll give them the pass, but I don't know exactly where they're going to go. Um, <clears throat> the, there were a lot of missionaries had been in New Guinea for a long period of time. And a lot of the natives had been converted and had learned English. I remember reading one letter where a guy says, we visited a native village and they sang, you know, my darling Clementine to us or some song such as that, <laughs> or Christian hymns. Um, they, I also, there's a the Anglican bishop who kept a diary during the war, and I've read that. And he says there's a lot of anger about the natives who work for the Japanese. And he said, really? And what would you have done? <laughs> These people show up and they start killing you. Would you tote their uh, luggage around if that's what they asked you to do? He says, so don't get so high on your horses. So you see what you would have done in, under similar circumstances. A lot of the uh, native peoples were guides, scouts, uh, litter bearers. Uh, I've read a lot of praise for them for their efforts to assist uh, the Australians and Americans in always subservient ways. They weren't, I think we're at a time now where you talk about racism and uh, classism and so forth. <clears throat> but they were, they would build uh, buildings with fronds and native timbers and so forth. A lot of the pictures you see of where the soldiers are living are structures that were built by the natives. So they, they were paid, they were not used in that sense, they were employed. And, uh, and I read a very touching letter from a soldier who went to visit a, a hospital and he came back to where he was stationed and wrote home about the wonderful natives who cared for the patients and how gentle they were and, and how sweet they were. And uh, a mother had her two children with her as she went around doing things. And he says, it's just a beautiful image of these people. Um, I'm trying to think whether I read any letters that made fun of them. I don't remember letters that, that ridiculed them. Read correctly that uh, when they were first doing atomic tests in the ocean, they were, they were doing them all again, saying, "Well, that's that's a that's a place where, where we don't have to worry about population." Where I don't do know Bikini and those. I don't know how far that is from New Guinea, where the atomic tests were done. Bikini and then we talk. I have no idea. Yeah. I thought there was some uh, testing done off New Guinea. I think the problem with testing off in New Guinea, if you're testing off in New Guinea, you're testing off of Australia, so I don't, I don't think it would be that close. I, I don't know, but check it. Check where those islands were. But I just wanted to make sure that that piece of the history is also noted, that that was populated Yes. already. Well, and they just had this tragic, talk about the cruise ship in Italy, but they had this ferry sink last week or two off of Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of people were lost in that, yeah. I think you, you mentioned about you had a session with two combat veterans and, and a man from New Guinea. Yes. It was a non-combat veteran. Yes. 
Well, I, you've got kind of a hierarchy there. If, if, if you're in the company of, of a combat veteran, he's, he's higher than you, no matter what his rank is. So you keep your mouth shut. That, that sort of Do you think that might have been a play there? Yes, because that, that, that exists all the way through. Yeah. And uh, uh, if, even his, his branch, if he's an infantry member with the CIB, he's much higher than, than, than maybe uh, somebody in air crew might be. Yeah, I did run into that interviewing a couple of veterans who ridiculed the support troops. Yeah. You know, they weren't real soldiers. Because, well, there's another problem that goes with that, too, is that when supply comes through, especially the Army is subject to a, a ration breakdown. And as it passes through the warehouse, they take everything they want. <laughs> and the guy, when he gets down on the line, he is all, he's usually short. You know, he, he, he's the one that you don't see that gets the warm jacket or that sort of thing. And, and it's especially in the school. So there's usually not a great deal of respect that goes down to the quartermaster. And, and that, you know, if, 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 the, if it's a good outfit, usually when they find out there's shortages, they find out the quartermasters are selling this stuff to the natives. Oh. And that's another common problem. So there's you, not a great deal of, of respect goes to the you brought a new perspective to my research. <laughs> With a question for this. Did you have I had one footnote to a gentleman's comment about the, the other people in the picture. You know, there are many um, veterans groups that uh, have produced uh, newsletters that are online and that, uh, that you, can, you can find out uh, a, a lot of collateral information about a particular incident in, in that newsletter. Did you hear him? No. He's talking about newsletters that have been put online by different units, and you might find the unit you're interested in does that. Yes? There, was there any indication as to how old he was when he was drafted into it? Yes, he was born in 1915, so he was fairly older when he was drafted in 1941. Who can do the math for me? 26, is that right? Uh, so he was older than you generally think of. Right. But they were taking, pretty soon they were taking almost everybody. And I only learned about this recently. There was a, an old man's draft. People know about that? No. So the, my draft? The, Just... Pardon me? An older man was drafted to Iraq. He was no. Everyone years old. born, everyone between the ages, of, and this is now a guess, something like a, between the ages of 40 and 65 had to register for the draft. These were men born in the 19th century, had to register for the draft, and the, recently th these cards have been released to the public, and are you can find them at Ancestry.com and so forth, um, in case they were needed. So I didn't know they went that old with people. Uh, but he was, uh, when I saw how old he was, I was surprised, but then I've, as I've looked at other records, he really wasn't that old. Because I know my five brothers, as soon as they graduated from high school and were 18, they had to register. Well, this man from uh, the mechanic uh, who was with the two Battle of the Bulge guys, he was literally taken out the day he was graduated and mm -hmm. sent. Just a second. Yeah. <laughs> was there any advantage to the V-mail over regular mail? Uh, was there any advantage to V-mail over regular mail? I've read uh, several letters where people say, I don't think one's faster than the other, so I'm going to have a contest. I will send you a letter on the same day, one V-mail, one airmail. Mm -hmm. But I never saw any definitive proof that either one was faster. It seemed that dependent on what was going on at the time as to who, which letter got through quickly. Was one cheaper? Uh, for soldiers writing from writing home, it was free. It was always free. Either yes. Way. Yeah. And no, not either way. Soldiers had free mail. Uh, the, you sending a letter to your son in New Guinea cost you money. No, but if you did it by airmail, it was just as cheap as either. I think airmail was more expensive. Yeah, airmail was five or seven cents. I think. Yeah, because airmail mail was free. I think that's right. Did you remember your second question? Oh, uh, yeah. 
my father was in the seventies, but he went in when he was seventeen <laughs> in the reserves. But um, he said there were a lot of older guys in the CBs because they had the skills and the knowledge that were needed to build the airstrips and the, you know, when, when they captured an island to do the building and, and that. So he says there, there were older guys hmm. in the CBs. My, uh, speaking of age, I had an uncle who was 45 was drafted in 42. And he was a veteran of World War One. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but th there was another point in age I, I think was interesting. You mentioned a couple of times in the book about where you said I've been in prison or I'm, I feel like a prisoner. Mm -hmm. I think that affected the older ones much younger than the 18 year olds uh, were, were more used to discipline and our restrictions. And they didn't, you never get that. But when you get in with the older ones, they seem to take that uh, that stance because they they had more freedom as, as uh, full grown adults. Yes, and they had established their own independent lives as, yeah. as husbands and, and employees. And, um, I just read about a letter. I forget where I read about it. It was after the book, where a guy was drafted the day after he got married. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know where it was. This it was his commander, the man who lives in New Orleans. And he told me the story about a guy who would come in when he was sensory male and he would just stand there. And he said, I just want to watch the mail being processed and hope for a letter. But he said he would occasionally see a tear in this man's eye because he had been taken right after he was married and was gone for three years. And he knew for a couple of months he was gone on that day. And, you know, who was he going home to? A stranger in both ways. Uh, so they would have to reestablish the relationship. Uh, one other source of older people in, in the forum were uh, members of a National Guard unit. The only unit was, uh, uh, was taken in. And so there was, would have been 30 and 40 year olds in it. And also, uh, there were a lot of people that uh, served in the CCC camps in the early 30s. And this was under the uh, Corps of Engineers, the run by the Corps of Engineers, and they essentially had basic training. And so those people that were CCC graduates, uh, uh, they were a few years older, and they were brought in, and they were given uh, uh, rank immediately upon the graduate. You know, this is what I like about these talks is that people, I said earlier, that people ask questions, but they also tell me stuff I didn't know, <laughs> and I learn more. Uh, anyone else? Well, thank you for coming out, and I appreciate it. And if you would like a copy of the book, let me know. I'll be standing in some corner somewhere with a pen in my hand if you're interested. Thank you.